There are four major theories um, of victimization to basically explain um, why some people uh, are more likely to be victims than others or why um, some victimization happens in some areas and things like that. Uh, so right off the bat, all of these all of these theories have been criticized for victim blaming. So sort of keep that in mind, um, although that is not the, the purpose of any of these um, any of these theories. It's not supposed to blame the victim so much as it is to recognize the um, sort of the factors that are relevant to victimization. So these theories are victim precipitation theory, lifestyle theory, deviant place theory, and routine activities theory. Um, so victim precipitation theory is um, basically the idea that some victims um, initiate whatever the incident was that actually leads to their victimization. So they do something to basically to to lead to um, what ends up being their victimization. And this can kind of happen in one of two ways. So the first is active precipitation. And this is where there is some intentional um, behavior on the part of the to be victim. So this could be if an, a victim acts provocatively, if they are belligerent, if they if they threaten um, somebody or even they might be the one who attacks first and then they just um, come out on the losing end. Uh, so depending on sort of situational factors, um, there are uh, there is sort of this can kind of explain the beginning of the situation while um, not necessarily justifying uh, we're not justifying offenders behavior, especially if it's you know they're they're just being belligerent and then you know somebody, really amps up the violence against them or something like that, but, um, or results in death, of course. Um, so it's not to excuse the, uh, the part of the offender so much as it is to basically recognize that victims can play a role. And so in active precipitation, those would absolutely be the victim playing some kind of intentional role in the beginning of the confrontation. Passive precipitation is a little bit more dicey and this is where it's um, unintentional kind of behavior on the victim's part and often the victim is unaware they're even doing anything that's uh, motivating somebody to offend against them. So the victim unknowingly threatens or encourages the attacker. So an example of this would be you know competition for a job or a love interest. So you know somebody gets they're just doing their thing they get the the job or the promotion but then somebody else is angry because they didn't. So there's that's completely unintentional. The victim is not doing anything to the offender, um, but the offender is slighted by that and is angered by that and provokes some kind of emotion, which then leads to some kind of crime being committed against the victim. Um, similarly, you know, well, you, if somebody gets the girl that they're after and well, that's going to piss somebody else off who wanted her and didn't get her or something like that. Um, so <clears throat> could also be like a, a, somebody wearing, you know, expensive clothing or jewelry that, um, that, you know, makes somebody really jealous. And so then that jealousy can prompt a, a crime happening, whether it's theft or some kind of violent victimization. Even something like a, a child who won't stop crying can be seen as passive precipitation because it is the obviously completely unintentional on the part of the child, but that is what causes it, you know, if it's, it becomes an abusive situation from their caretaker, then that is what caused that incident to start. Obviously without, we're not blaming the child for that, but that was the beginning of the motivation for the offender to commit their crime. Um, so this can also sometimes just, depending on how we interpret it, it can just be the fact that a victim belongs to a certain group. So this would be something like, you know, belonging to a certain racial or ethnic group, an immigrant population, um, you know, group based on sexuality. And so this would be where hate crimes fit in. And so somebody could be, you know, in you know, arg angering or, you know, causing some kind of, um, some kind of strong emotion in an offender just by virtue of being part of one of those groups that they obviously don't have a choice over. Uh, so it's, it, again, it's not about blaming the victim so much as explaining why the um, the crime happens. And, and part of the explanation is sort of what the victim did, either intentionally or unintentionally, to begin the whatever the confrontation was that led to some kind of violent um, or lethal interaction. <clears throat> so then lifestyle theory um, looks more at something about the victim's lifestyle 
that increases their exposure either to crime or offenders or both. And so what this means is that there's something about the way that the victim lives their life that puts them at risk. And so certain groups are going to be at particularly high risk. So this would be groups like if you know the homeless, runaways, drug users, by virtue of being part of those groups, those people are at higher risk for certain types of crimes. They're, so they, they have certain vulnerabilities, they are um, you know, in situations where they're interacting with certain people um, or you know, they're, they're, they're less safe and things like that. So certain groups by definition of being part of that group are just put at higher risk. Um, college lifestyle is one of those things that if you live a certain type of college lifestyle, you are also putting yourself at more risk. So, you know, things like, you know, partying and recreational drug use and either living with or spending time or both um, with a lot of other young people who are the high risk group both to offend and be victimized, then just sort of that lifestyle puts you at risk for certain types of crimes as well. And then the criminal lifestyle is very similar in the sense that by virtue of being a criminal, then that is also going to increase the likelihood of victimization because of the types of people that you're interacting with, the types of situations you find yourself in, um, and um, you know, hanging around with other criminals, being put in high risk situations. Also, there's vulnerability here because um, if somebody knows that you are a criminal or you lead the criminal lifestyle, they know that you're less likely to report to police. So that's a specific type of vulnerability because you don't want to involve the police if you're a criminal. So by virtue of being part of these groups and sort of the type of things that these that people do based on whatever group that they're a part of, there are certain types of lifestyles that have increased risk. So you can see how this could be seen as victim blaming as well, because again, you know, the, the perception might be, oh, well, you know, well, just because somebody's homeless doesn't mean that they deserve to be offended against. Well, yes, that's absolutely true but it doesn't mean that they're not still at greater risk because they are homeless. So that's what this theory is kind of trying to, trying to explain is that it's not the victim's fault, but there are certain things that by virtue of being part of different groups and the types of lifestyle that are led that it, it, you're gonna be at higher risk. So deviant place theory is kind of similar to lifestyle theory, except it's spoke, it specifically focuses on the places so it's not about the lifestyle so much as it is, is where do you spend your time? So the actual locations are the focus of deviant place theory. And so basically the more exposure you have to dangerous places, the higher your likelihood of victimization um, to the point where neighborhood crime levels might actually be more predictive than any individual characteristics. So knowing where somebody lives or spends a lot of time could actually be more predictive in terms of their likelihood of victimization than anything about them as an individual. And so when we talk about dangerous places, that means places with higher levels of poverty um, because um, you have sort of all of the, the problems that come along with poverty, one of those often being dense populations. And so that, that, that those dense populations are another sort of indicator of a dangerous place. You have a lot of people in close proximity, you're gonna have more problems. Uh, also, if there's more transients, so more people moving in and out more often, uh, you're going to have a more dangerous place because you, it's, you know, you're surrounded by strangers. And so if you're surrounded by strangers a lot, then you're not going to have protection from people the way that you would if you, you know, develop friendships and relationships. And then also when there is a mix of commercial and residential areas um, and, and buildings, then you're going to have a more dangerous place because this means that there are you know, buildings that are probably empty at night, for example, which is a great place for crime to happen. Um, you're going to have um, less protection of areas because when you think about where you live, you protect that area because it's where you live, but you won't have somebody protecting a commercial building the way that they would protect a residential building. As well, um, where you see a purely residential areas, that's going to be more places like the suburbs or something where um, that also ties in with less poverty, less dense populations, and less transients. So um, in terms of people moving in and out. So a lot of these things kind of coincide and they, and they often go together. But the more poverty you have, the more densely populated an area is, the higher the proportion of people moving in and out, and the more commercial residential mix, the more you have of all of those things, the more dangerous the place is. And from a deviant place theory, the higher your likelihood of victimization, which makes sense. And when you think about it, 
these places are not fun places to live. So if people, people basically work to be able to move out of these places. So if you work your way up enough that you are working your way out of poverty or you can, you know, you're better able to support your family or whatever, when you want to get out of those places, you're going to get out. So then that begs the question of, well, who's left? And the people that are left are the people who are either just moving in, who are, are who, which means that they're in some kind of financial dire straits or whatever to be there. Uh, or maybe they've just moved to the area and they don't know anybody or what have you. So there are those risk factors that bring those people in or the people who can't leave because they can't get out. So the, the poorest of the people there, homeless, addicts, the elderly poor, um, people with mental disabilities, the mo people who are most vulnerable to crime then are left to make up the population in these areas. So that makes it even more dangerous in these areas. And then we have routine activities theory, and um, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, so routine activities theory, uh, Cohen and Felsen developed this in 1979. One of the major underlying assumptions of routine activities theory is that crime is normal, meaning that given certain situations um, and certain characteristics uh, of people in within those situations, crime is a natural thing to be happening. So under certain conditions, crime is the natural normal response or normal outcome. And so it's called routine activities theory because it comes from this idea that the routine activities, so literally the daily activities that somebody engages in, is going to affect whether or not they are likely to converge with somebody who is motivated to offend against them. And um, so this kind of this theory kind of came about to explain why there was a you know an increase in crime against women and an increase in break-ins and this was sort of tied to the shift in routine activities of women going into the workforce so in the you know in the 60s and 70s women were going into the workforce in droves and then that means that they are not in the protection of their home anymore so they're more likely to interact with other people who could potentially offend against them so we're going to see higher Crime, higher rates of crimes committed against women, but also now the homes are left unguarded during the day, so they're more likely to be broken into. So it, those, the shift in routine activities helped to explain why we saw changes in some of those crime rates. Um, and so the focus of routine activities theory then is the combination of situational factors plus offender factors and how those interact in time and space to create situations where crime is the natural, normal outcome. So here's what routine activities theory looks like. So you have this combination of you have the motivated offender, a suitable target, and the absence of capable guardians. So a mo motivated offender just means that it's somebody there who is willing to take advantage of whatever situation has presented itself. And from routine activities theory perspective, or this kind of approach, the, the assumption is that every, literally everybody has a threshold at which they would be motivated to commit a crime. It would have to be, you know, a for some of us, that threshold is very high. And so, you know, we would have to have very specific conditions, you know, like we're definitely going to get away with it and nobody's going to get hurt and, you know, whatever. And, and, you know, it doesn't go against any of our major moral, you know, limitations or whatever. So if we, if everybody has that threshold, it's just that threshold is different for some people have really high thresholds and some people have really thr low thresholds. But given the right situation, somebody could be motivated to commit a crime. So if you have somebody motivated given the situation, then you have your motivated offender. And then you have a suitable target. So this means that for that situation, for that the type of motivation that that offender has, it is the right, the right target. The target could be a person, it could be an object, it could be a house, um, but whatever the target is, um, is suitable for the, the motivation of the offender. So they're going to get what they want from it and you know it's it's a vulnerable target or what have you so um it's suitable for that person and then you need the absence of capable guardians and this means that there is nobody there or nothing there to stop the crime from happening so capable guardians could be police it could just be other people it could be security cameras or other security systems but it's something that's going to stop the crime from happening so basically routine activities theory says that when all these three things converge in time and space that is when you have a crime happen. And this is where I like to clarify that it doesn't mean crime can happen, it means a crime will happen because, it's, because it is the normal, natural response when these three things converge in time and space. Because if a crime is not happening, it means one or more of these things is missing. So maybe the person there's nobody around who's motivated for that specific situation, even if it seems like there's a suitable target and no capable guardians around. 
Uh, maybe there's it's not the exact target for the person's motivation. So whatever it might be, if any of these things are missing, then a crime's not going to happen. But if they all converge in time and space and all of these things are present, that is when a crime is the natural, normal outcome for that situation.